Karen and Richard Carpenter look like a couple of bright, well-scrubbed youngsters from middle America who happen to come up with a sound the public likes. A case of the lightning striking a fortunate pair. Lightning that might just as well have flashed on some other musical group. Well, there's a little more to the Carpenters than that. It's true, they really are bright and well-scrubbed, and their background is as wholesome as a Norman Rockwell painting. But they worked a long time and endured a great deal to maneuver themselves into the spot where lightning could find them. Their parents brought them to California years ago simply to have them near the center of show business. Karen and Richard worked at their music and thought they were good. But for year after year, no one listened. They endured rudeness and rejection that would have broken the spirits of most hopefuls. And then it happened. Success so sudden, so overwhelming, that they're still a little dazed. They've sold 16 million records in the past two years. Karen, at 21, and Richard, 25, are millionaires. They own apartment houses and shopping centers. They still live at home with their parents in the not especially fashionable community of Downey. But that home is undergoing some explosive changes in keeping with the new status of its residents. How do a couple of young stars live once the lightning finds them out? Jerry Dunphy here, and Karen and Richard Carpenter are waiting to tell us. Rich, we know the Carpenters have made it big. Uh, how big? Well, um, you know, I don't want to sound like an egomaniac or anything, but uh, we have, you know, we've been very lucky. In like very successful. A, in, in a year and a half, we've got uh, uh, seven gold records. And, uh, seven? Yes, yeah, seven. And uh, a song we introduced did win an Oscar. And uh, I don't know, I just I never really thought about it. In terms of big, you know, well, uh, uh, we've done a, you know, like a movie theme, and uh, we've played all over the world, the Carnegie Hall and Royal Albert Hall, and uh, the Hollywood Bowl, where we you know, like had entered that uh, uh, Battle of the Bands. We had played it as the Carpenters and had quite a big turnout, you know. Well, I guess I could ask, are you a millionaire? Uh, yeah, yeah, we are. You say we are. Are you a millionaire? Yeah, Karen and, and both separately. Yeah. Separately, not yeah. not together. No. You don't have to pool to be a no, no. Uh, been very lucky. What the, what do you do with your money? Uh, well, invest quite a bit of it because, like I've heard, you know, like you hear so many people who make a bunch, and then the next thing you know, they're they're busted because they blow it all. You know, so I don't want to end up in that department either. Does Karen? So we invest uh, jointly. We invest in uh, we own uh, one shopping center in Torrance, another one's being built in Downey, with the music center involved in the middle of that and uh, the pair of apartment houses, and we've also invested quite a bit in this house, you know. I don't feel you can go too wrong in real estate, but uh, I do spend quite, you know, some just on fun, you know, like on cars and records and pianos and, and stuff like that, too. You know? How many cars do you have? Uh, three, right <laughs> off. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. three. Three or four. Sports cars? Well, I'll sports just, uh, yeah, I got a sports car and a luxury car and a, and a race car. Uh, one of the other ways it seems to me that you've spent your money is right here on the house. You're doing things to it right now. Right. It was uh, fairly big when we bought it. I mean, it was like big compared to what we had lived in before, you know. And uh, But after you know, we lived here for a while, it's still, we never had a place, you know, to rehearse. We did have, uh, you know, when we first, in the, in the original house, a room for music, but it was, it was just a bedroom. This was a five-bedroom house. And so we took, we didn't need five bedrooms, so we took one and uh, put the stereo up there. But uh, there was no room for a real piano and uh, hardly enough of the records I was collecting. And when I wanted to put in the four channel, there was definitely no room for that either. So uh, I always wanted to work. The good piano we did have, the grand, was down in the living room. So I still ended up doing the arrangements and everything with the dogs barking and people going in and out. So that's why we felt a necessity for a bigger room. This room has got to be a musician's dream. <laughs> what have you got here and what do you do here? Well, uh, we usually use it mostly for uh, arranging and uh, orchestrating. It's a, good, a great place to work, you know. I finally had it built because it's all soundproofed and uh, we also can rehearse in here and uh, just listen to records and stuff like that. We've got quadraphonic sound. That's the newest thing. Four track, stere four channel stereo. You know, It's about 125 watts per channel. And uh, grand piano and uh, guitar amps and drums for rehearsing. It's a workroom, in other words. Yeah, a workroom for arranging and uh, 
composing and, and, for, and just for listening and analyzing, analyzing what you do. Right, doing. right. Uh, okay. You've got your sound, the carpenter sound, but the, I would suppose there, there had to be an influence uh, of some kind that uh, maybe even Bach. Oh, yeah. Why don't you have a seat? Crazy chairs. Oh, in case you're wondering where we got them, we didn't go out and have them made or anything. They're, uh, they're gifts from the Carol Burnett Show. Every time you're on the Carol Burnett Show? Every time you're, you're on the Carol Burnett Show, you get uh, uh, chairs made while you're rehearsing and everything, and then they give them to you. And Enough appearances, and you and Yeah, you fill out furniture your whole house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Bach was, uh, of course, one influence, and uh, all the classical composers, you know, Baroque classics, and uh, really quite a few people. Uh, Les Paul and Harry Ford had quite a bit to do with, uh, I suppose, our vocal sound. As far as influencing me as an arranger, the Beach Boys, the Beatles, and Bacharach. You know. Did uh, did you and uh, Karen? Did you did you talk that over? I mean, did you say uh, this is what we ought to try to develop, and this is the way we should go about it? Or in the first place, did it come by accident? It sort of came by accident. You know, for we just went through what we liked. Uh, originally, you know, neither of us sang. Karen played drums, I played piano. We had a buddy who plays uh, tuba with the Detroit Symphony now, but he was a bass player then. And uh, we had a trio, and we just concentrated mostly on jazz. And we entered the Hollywood Bowl Battle of the Bands in 1966 and won it. And we stuck with the, you know, the jazz until Wes started getting interested in the tuba and got very proficient at it and ended up going to Juilliard School of Music. Meanwhile, I was going to college and, and uh, not only majoring in piano, but also studying, uh, not studying voice, but in the, in the choir and getting very interested in voice. And this is when I got the idea to start a vocal group. So Karen had started singing by then, and we added some people that we had met at college and started this group, vocal group called Spectrum which later evolved into Big Cartman. I mean, the guys quit because we couldn't get a recording contract, and we, you know, uh, went around for about a year trying to get someplace, and uh, zero, so everybody went their own way. Karen and I started doing the, the stuff ourselves, overdubbing all the, uh, the voices ourselves rather than have other people sing them. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry I'm Hi. late. No, 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 sit down. I'm fine. I was Karen. having a little problem with the... Uh, it always takes me a little longer. But I'm here now. Girls a girl. <laughs> uh, Karen, um, one thing that's always been in short supply is pretty girl drummers. How did this all get started? Uh, well, um, that is due to um, when I was in high school, I was influenced by a, a friend of mine that had been playing drums since he was three years old. And he really knocked me out. So I, uh, I really liked the drums and decided to take them up. So that's the way it came about. At that time, when you were taking up the drums. Were you confident that the music would uh, take you as far as it did? At that time, I really didn't uh, have any ideas of where I was going, but he had always wanted to be exactly where he is. He had ideas, but I didn't know I could do anything until 16. And uh, when I took up the drums, both the drums and the voice started to come yeah, she started together. Yeah, the same time. Did, but did folks like to say, Girl drummer, well, why, oh, why, yeah. Karen, why do you want to do that? Well, they, everybody kind of looked at me funny, but I didn't, I didn't really care. Were either of your parents professional musicians? Uh, not no, musicians, not really. no. My dad had a real love for music and quite a, a, a collection of records, like even when I was born. I, mean, I used to play 78s and everything. They're more appreciators yeah. than players, you know. But, uh, you know, Karen's interested in development until she was around 16, but... And my interest in playing didn't even start till I was around 12. But up until then, from I think two on, I was listening yeah, to records constantly. Yeah, he was constantly. always listening, all the time. And my parents always thought that there was something there and encouraged it. Um, didn't they have high hopes uh, at one time, a long time ago? And isn't that one of the reasons you came to California? Yeah. yeah. They yeah. always, they always saw, they saw it in him, like you mentioned. But uh, yeah, until. I didn't, I didn't do anything. Until she got to Cal, about you know, two years after nothing. we were in California. But, my, you know, parents thought we were going to be a, I was going to be a, some sort of a, a just you know, a solo like pianist. Liberace I mean, it was before we got into know. voice, it was before groups, as far as like the Beatles type groups came out. And yeah. But how old were you then? When she we came 13. out, I was 13. And nothing happened but, until you know, three my, years my, later. They, they thought, uh, like, uh, nothing's ever going to happen, like in New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah, so, we, you know, we got to get home with. Right. Yeah, that was home. Right. Yeah. 
They just wanted to be in a surroundings where it might have happened easier, you know. To a layman, of course, it sounds easy. You walk into a studio and you sit down and play, but there's really a lot more to it than that, isn't there? We, we find all the material ourselves, you know, and then I arrange it, orchestrate it, and uh, that takes time. And uh, then we do all the vocals, which is quite right. a few. We have one chord on, on our, our second album that has a 39-voice yeah. chord. It's a 13-voice chord overdubbed three times. Well, that takes time, two people right, singing yeah. at a time, you know? You do two parts at a time, and you keep laying it over well, each other yeah, until yeah. you get... But it takes you know. time. The big sound, the, the, the full sound. Right, right the yeah. sound. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you don't always get it the first time. No. Yeah. So that's what it takes. It takes us quite a long time. Yeah, it does. Karen, you and Rich uh, have a lot of fans, but uh, are there any that are especially insistent? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> some really strange things happen, you know, because uh, some people, when they want to try to get to you, they go and about it in many different ways you know it's uh the way they uh some of the things they think up to try and get to you like one time uh somebody wanted to get us a tape so i got this beautiful bouquet of flowers in this box you know and i'm saying well you know what the heck that could be because it wasn't anybody's birthday or anything and i opened it up and there's beautiful flowers there's this tape right in the middle of it you know they find the wildest ways and they some of them can bug you pretty, pretty much, too, can't they? Well, no. Some, some things, if it gets too, uh, if it happens too much in one day, you, you, you know, you figure, wow. But some kids pull the funniest things that you just can't get upset, you know, because they really think of some wild ways to get in. When you're on tour, do you have a chance to have rap sessions with your fans? That's a little hard, too, because um, we're in and out. Like, when you come in... To do a concert, you uh, you run in and you you're in there for like a rehearsal during the afternoon, and nobody is usually allowed into the rehearsals. Uh, and then you you know you go get dressed and you do the show, and then Zoom. You know you're either uh, gone right away or else you're in the dressing room doing interviews and things. So when you finally come out, there's not that much time that you have to spend with them, which is kind of not as much time as we like to spend, but it's really kind of hard because it's not that much time. Uh, when the Carpenter fans uh, write uh, to you, yeah. I understand they get a kind of a 
personal carpenter attention. Yeah, Catherine? that, um, I think my parents can answer that better. Hey, Mom, Dad, why don't you guys come on in? Talk to Jerry a minute. Hello. Hi, Mrs. Carpenter, uh, fan letters, you're, you're, uh, Harold, hello. Fine. You've had a lot to, to do with the fan mail in the past. I suppose you've, they've gotten so much of it now, you're almost away from it. Isn't that true? Uh, I did uh, take care of most of it at the beginning, but it got a little beyond me after a while. Actually, we have personal friends that are working for us that help with the fan mail, and we still take a lot of interest in it because, you know, a lot of kids ask a lot of questions and they want to be real close to Richard and Karen and feel like they're their brother and sister. And you want and to keep them that way? We want to keep them that way, Certainly. that's true. Karen, what about, uh, we've been talking about fans, what about proposals? Do you get any of those in the mail? <laughs> yeah, that, um, that gets a little embarrassing sometimes because... Uh, Sticky. It is, it really is, because you don't want to hurt, you know, whoever has the idea. But uh, a couple of times we've gotten rings, you know, and you don't, you don't want to send them back. It's like, it's really touchy, you know. Well, actually, but you, well I was going to say, actually, we do at once. But if they send it back a second time, then we feel we're hurting their feelings, and then we keep them. But we say, you know, that uh, we don't feel it's right for them to be sending her jewelry, you know. Yeah, I mean, some, they spend, you know, quite a bit of money. And I mean, proposals, not, too? Yeah. It's, you know, it's... You, you actually, can't give a form letter uh, reply no. to a proposal, oh, no, can you? No, 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 <laughs> no. Actually, really uh, they have fans, like I keep saying, from 3 to 83, and they're all interested in... We try to keep everybody happy here, and uh, our friends do, and Harold takes a personal interest in all of the uh, things and tries to look Mrs. at most Harper, of the letters. Uh, are you surprised at the kid's success? Well, uh, not really surprised. I'm glad. <laughs> but we always had hopes because we could see their talent, and we tried to do our best to help that along. And they've always uh, had a great interest in music since they were kids, you know. They'd swing and listen to the music, and Richard always wanted to play piano and she uh, at well, well she took a little bit longer to take an interest she liked baseball at first and then she went into <laughs> drums get into the league. suddenly she wanted <laughs> drums and then finally the singing probably the degree of success here maybe that's that's surprising oh well it is yes and no it's i guess it's a former thing that you really don't know where it'll end you know we had faith or how or even if it would get off the ground, you know. It's hard to tell, really. We've talked about uh, your successes, but there must have been some lean years. Uh, those were the years, I think, when the experts said that your sound wouldn't sell. That's right. They uh, said it for several years. Uh, one year of that was like from 67 to 68, you know, and that's when we had the Spectrum group. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, they got discouraged. Um, and split up after a year's worth of it. But uh, I wasn't going to let up. Anyway. During those years, was there a substantial change in your sound? Did you try to accommodate? No. Did you try to adjust? Did you try to make yourself more commercial, more saleable? No, that's no. one of the things that uh, people think. You know, they, they say, how did you, um, how, did they, how, did, how did you figure out where to aim and, you know, to sell records? And that's one thing you, you can't do. Um, well, they thought it was a master plan, you know. Yeah, they do. And it's not, uh, it doesn't happen that way because you just, what we did was uh, when we finally did get a chance to cut a record, we just did what we felt we could do the best and what came, the arrangement that came out of his head. Did, did it ever occur to you or, or did some say, I think you kids are out of sync? Uh, with your time, with the soft sound at the time that the oh, the, sure. the rock noises were at their yeah, highest, yeah, yeah. mostly everybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's what took uh, when we finally did get into A and M Records. It took uh, Herb Alpert, who was a musician, and not uh, he's the musician half of the A and M. He's not yeah. the business half, and he uh, saw what he liked musically in it and didn't stop to think whether it would sell or not. He just took us because he dug it. Brothers and sisters usually 
love to fight. How do you manage to get along so well? Or do you? Yeah, well, yeah. most of the time we get along, yeah. sure. You know, every now and then, a little tiff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> not, not very often. No. Does it have to do with business? Yeah, yeah always things. with, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, what you think you ought to do and how you ought yeah. to do it? Yeah. Is that where it is? Yeah, uh -huh. it was very rare. You ever say to him, Rick, I like the, the arrangement, I can't do that. That was the you last can't. one. That was yeah, the last that fight. was about it. Uh, well, you hit right on it. That was uh, we've been else. talking. Um, we hardly fight at all, you know, but we had one dilly, and that was, <laughs> that was exactly what it was about, you know. Neither one of us is really in the mood to uh, discuss it, and we both got into it. It was kind of funny. And nobody know? won. It wasn't funny then. Oh, no, nobody won at all. No, you just go... Musically, how do you go about uh, bridging the generation gap? There's some, there's, you know, there's certain groups that do it. Brad does it. Uh, Fifth Dimension. Association. Association and a couple of tunes did it. And even the Beatles. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, they were number they one the, at the easy listening chart with something. The broadest and spectrum. If you ever didn't. tried to tell people in 1964 that the that Beatles were going to be that, the number yeah. of easy listening, they never would have believed it, you know. But, uh... We appeal, and easy listening groups like us appeal to all ages, uh, but not everybody. People say, hey, you appeal to everybody. Well, nobody appeals to everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there's some people who would think that, uh, you know, there's some people who think I look like a hippie. I mean, I mean, they're that square that they think that I look wild or, you know, that we sing rock and roll music just because we have guitar amplifiers. Yeah. Then there's other people that think that we're so square, square that, that they don't believe ridiculous. how we can exist. But there are people of all ages that, you know, that, that we do that appeal do like to. It, yeah. It's weird. We've gotten letters where the, where the kid writes in and says, you know, he bought his, uh, or his or her parents our album for, for Christmas, Christmas or for their birthday. I mean, like in our case, the parents don't mind uh, paying $4 because the kid says, hey, can I have $4 for an album? I said, well, who is it? The Carpenters. Oh, yeah, I can listen to the Carpenters, the parents say, and give the kid 4 bucks. So it's not just... Our albums yeah. just sell to kids, they sell to, and teenagers, they sell to everybody. Karen and Richard Carpenter, just a couple of nice kids from Downey, California, who happen to make about a million dollars a year. I don't know what effect they're going to have on our culture, but I suspect that they're causing a lot of other nice kids to work a lot harder at those music lessons. Jerry Dunphy here.